Um, tonight we're going to take the story of Dr. Barry a stage further. And um, we're going to look at the period um, from the time when uh, Dr. Barry left the Cape until the time she left St. Helena. And it was quite a, a big... It, a bit louder. Sorry, is that okay? Okay. So, after leaving the Cape, Barry went to, uh, was posted to Mauritius. There's just some feedback going on. Why did she leave the Cape? Because she'd been there for years and years and years, and the, the military doctor didn't stay in one place forever. They were posted around. And, um, Barry had been in the Cape from about 1816 to about 1828, which is 12 years, which is quite a long time for a military doctor to be in one place. So uh, she had been in Mauritius um, uh, uh, on a previous occasion to help with the first pandemic of co cholera. Um, but by the time Barry arrived in Mauritius, the, the epidemic which was taking place there was already settling, so she had, it wasn't a, a very useful exercise. But um, back to Mauritius, as an um, 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 official medical officer, she went in 1828. And um, here, can we have the next slide, please? Um, there was, uh, as with some of these islands, I couldn't actually get to Mauritius myself to do the research. And um, there was a Professor Vijay Tilok who helped me in this, I say, here. And we see B B Barry's own um, comments. He was, I was sent to the Mauritius, served there about 18 months. That was a bit generous of him. And was recalled in consequence the serious illness of Lord Charles Somerset, upon whose death I proceeded to Jamaica, and that is all great. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to talk about the dodo, but this, and this bird is uh, indelibly associated with Mauritius. I think it appears on the island's coat of arms, and it has the um, distinction of the shortest human extinction of any creature that we know of. The, um, of within about 65, of being 65 years of being discovered, there were no more dodos. Um, that was rather sad, but anyway, that's what happened. Next slide, please. Oh, yes. <coughs> Dr. Barry um, went uh, to, um, to Mauritius by sea uh, on a ship called um, uh, Eliza Jane, and it was quite a quick voyage. Um, they were doing about 180 nautical miles a day, which was really quite quick for a sailing vessel. Um, he uh, went into uh, Port Louis Harbour, which over there, Port Louis, you see the rather striking post-volcanic uh, uh, cones that they, these are extinct volcanoes, the ship going in, and just go back one side please, and the record, harbour record shows that Dr. Barry was here um, on the medical staff, surgical medical staff, um, he went with his soldier servant, John Smith, who was English, and he went with, this was his um, Khoisan uh, apprentice, Peter Danster, and um, <clears throat> he was te uh, uh, teaching this youngster to be a coachman. So they arrived at uh, Port Louis that we've just seen, and um, his time on this tropical island was, de 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 was de uh, destined to be neither long nor particularly happy, free from conflict. Right from the time that he got there, things went wrong. Firstly, Barry's rank was of that of a staff surgeon, which in the army was a major, and the governor appointed an, another um, surgeon um, as the uh, principal medical officer, uh, who was of junior rank to Barry, and quite rightly, Barry took offence at this, and there was a, uh, there was an, um, a fight. So tension reigned until the trans chance the arrival of a, a deputy inspector general who had been in uh, Ceylon. 
He was, he'd worked there for a long time and was uh, gratefully on his way home and put in at uh, uh, Mauritius and found that he uh, was ha being detained there to become the principal medical officer. And uh, <coughs> Barry was um, mollified by giving the post of superintending surgeon, which sort of kept, calmed him down a bit. Peace then prevailed. The garrison was smaller than many. Um, the usual garrison was about 2,500 men, but there were about 1,800 on uh, souls in the garrison, including women and children. And apart from the usual uh, effects of uh, um, uh, punishment and VD, there were no particular um, diseases that came across, apart from a few tropical fevers, dysentery, and tuberculosis was quite common on uh, Mauritius. <coughs> Let's have the next slide, please. Can anybody guess what this is? A what? Well, it's, an, it's a scope, but it's an, a very early model stethoscope, the thing that the doctor used for looking at it. This was the next stethoscope. He was a French doctor, and uh, this was the very first stethoscope. And that was introduced um, uh, on Mauritius at the time when Dr. Barry was there. Um, <coughs> For the interest of any medical member, are there any medical people in the uh, in the audience? Well, um, there were a couple of uh, I've went through all the records. There were a couple of aneurysms which um, uh, were mentioned. An aneurysm is like a blowout of an artery. It's a very simple way of getting it. And in these days, an aneurysm is due to weakness of the artery wall, due to atheroma or something like this. In those times, the aneurysm was usually due to syphilitic. Uh, um, destruction of the wall and so the wall of the artery becomes weak and with the constant water hammer pulse of the blood coming out they get bigger and bigger and one in a soldier called um, uh, uh, let's see that, um, just can't remember the name but he's um, Hamilton Isaac Hamilton was his name he died a rapid death because he um, an aortic aneurysm, big artery in the middle of the, the body, that ruptured and as you can imagine pints of blood spew out, that can't last very long. And the other one was more interesting. Let's have the next slide please. It was an, an aneurysm in a man's neck and um, it was um, uh, uh, a thing about the size of uh, Muhammad Ali's fist, a big thing. I'll show you a big picture. Let's see the next slide. This is a, a, a picture done for me by Fanny Becker, who's an artist. But you can see uh, just above the collarbone, there's this big, big fist-sized thing. There's not a lot of room for it there. And in the carotid arteries, which go up to the, the brain and the, the rest of the skull. And this would uh, is definitely not a thing that you want to have. It, was, uh, it, would, it would rupture, again, with, with immediate death. So um, <clears throat> Barry wrote this paper about it and gave it, sent it to a chap called James Wardrop, who was a, an, an English doctor who was interested in these surgeons. Wardrop l liked this. Uh, it was a very good description about it. Uh, and this, he actually had it published under Barry's name in this particular issue of The Lancet in 1833. You can see here. So Barry sort of rushed into print there. Uh, <clears throat> and um, he, uh, he described the case and uh, it, he described a vigorously pulsating mass in the left side of the patient's neck. Um, precisely where it would be necessary to make an infection to get at it. This is a summary of Barry's thing. It was um, not a pleasant prospect either for the surgeon or the patient, especially as there was no anesthesia at that time. Anesthetic was still 17 or 18 years away in the future. So Barry went on to describe in some detail the surgical technique of tying off the carotid artery, the operation was performed in about 25 minutes, which is uh, pretty quick, I can assure you. And one can only admire the calmness and skill of the surgeon operating and also the bravery of the patients. 
<clears throat> Barry also added, there's a little postscript, um, it is but fair to remark that the operation was undertaken under very unfavorable circumstances. The patient had been told by some inconsiderate friends that if he submitted to an operation, he must die. It wasn't an, uh, it wasn't an, uh, an exceptionally bad warning. But however, uh, he, uh, he was at last satisfied that he had no alternative but that the tumor would soon burst. So that was an interesting thing. So, sorry, was that a question? The patient lived for a while, yes. He lived long enough to get out of the hospital and then the thing is, he, he had syphilis, and uh, I can't tell you what happened in the long term, and that isn't mentioned in this, in this article, which is the only uh, documentation we have of it. Um, then there was the matter of Mrs. Fenton. Uh, Mrs. Fenton and her husband, they were been in India. He was an officer in the army, and he had taken up a new post in Tasmania. And Mr. and Mrs. Doc, uh, Captain and Mrs. Fenton were um, on their way to, uh, um, to Tasmania. <clears throat> she was pregnant, and she didn't fancy being delivered by some unknown doctor in the Roaring Forties that they'd have to go through. So she, des she decided to stop in Mauritius and have her baby there, and um, the husband went on to take up his post in, uh, in Tasmania. <clears throat> Um, by invitation of the governor, um, Flora, the baby's name, was born, uh, was born at Government House uh, after all of five days of labor. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a very straightforward, uh, straightforward case. <coughs> anyway, there was much relief and gratitude uh, um, after the arrival of the baby, and everybody uh, else would have thought that that, that would be a, a happy occasion, except for Dr. Barry, whose nose was put out of joint, because Barry was good at obstetrics, and th thought, he thought that he should have been called to see to the delivery there. And uh, he tried to trump up a charge against the other two doctors, saying that Mrs. Fenton was a civilian and the two hospital doctors shouldn't have delivered her. But fortunately, the governor, Colville, by this time, knew, knew had the measure of Barry, and he said uh, that because Mrs. Fenton's husband had been an army officer, it was perfectly all right for her to have been treated um, in the army hospital. Um, Continuing with her narrative, Mrs. Fenton wrote a very interesting memoir, which was published years, years later in a uh, publication called um, uh, Queries and Answers. She, she, wrote, <coughs> she wrote something most intriguingly. <coughs> she said, there's certainly something extraordinary about the same Dr. Barry. I remember one night in India, I was sitting at a room of a friend and helping to watch her along, um, she was also in, in labour, along with a nurse tender much in esteem in Calcutta, who began to recount some details of her former life to me. She said that she had been driven from the Cape by Dr. Barry. One night when she was uh, 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 Suppose the lady who was in labor needed a prompt medical attention. She herself ran and made an unceremonious entry into Dr. Barry's room. <clears throat> Thereupon he flew in, into a violent, most violent uh, uh, passion. She declares and steadily maintains that the nominal Dr. Barry was and is a woman. From this time, he displayed the most implacable dislike to her and forced her to go to India. So this is the first occasion when Barry's true sex was, uh, was discovered. There was one other occasion which we'll come to in a future occasion. <coughs> um, it was also at about this time, April 1829, that Barry's former benefactor, the Earl of Buchan, died. 
He'd been a very man with a very sharp brain. He was one of the founders of uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, and unfortunately, he'd um, become very senile in, uh, in, his eight, eight year, uh, in his old age, and he died aged 87 years. <coughs> now, there was a further impulsive act on the part of Dr. Barry. He quit his post at Mauritius without notice. He went absent without official leave, AWOL, on the 27th of August, 1829. <clears throat> News had arrived to him, arrived from England, that Lord Charles Somerset was seriously ill. And without attending to the formalities, Barry hastened to see his former patron, friend and, and mentor as soon as possible. A vessel, the brig Rifleman, was uh, in the harbour at um, Port Louis and it was sailing on the following day. So Barry and his two servants piled on board they, this, uh, um, and they w sailed off, to, uh, obviously going to Cape Town first where these two servants uh, disembarked and Barry himself went on to England arriving in London in this, on December the 12th, 1829. <coughs> the story uh, possibly uh, true, possibly not true, but it uh, appeared in uh, Charles Dickens' um, uh, piece about Dr. Barry. And Dickens seemed to he seemed to ha know quite a lot about Barry. Um, when Barry left Mauritius, Dickens wrote um, a, a piece which was reported to him, and he just seemed to know more about Barry. He must have had some sort of uh, um, uh, information system. But the story um, which appeared, first occurred in uh, All the Year Round, which was Dickens' magazine, was s told of an interview between James, Dr. Barry uh, and um, uh, Sir James McGregor, who was the head of the medical department uh, in, uh, in the army. The director general asked him um, something like this, Sir, You've returned without leave of absence. May I ask you how, to, how this is? Well, said James, coolly running his long white fingers through his hair, I've come home to have my hair cut. <laughs> now, it's very difficult to see how a chap can get away with that, but uh, get away with it he did. <coughs> Now, let us look at uh, uh, the last days of Lord Charles Somerset. This is the reason why Barry came back. <clears throat> In his memorandum of service, which he wrote during the very early retirement, Barry wrote, I, I was sent to the Mauritius. I served there about 18 months, which is slight exaggeration, and was recalled in consequence of the serious illness which Lord Charles Somerset of Lord Charles Somerset, upon whose death I proceeded to Jamaica. <clears throat> Barry found his patient at his London home in Piccadilly and in cardiac failure. Digitalis by then was in common use, and it's reasonable to suppose that Bar Barry treated his patient with, uh, with this drug, with this preparation. It was here, let's have the next slide please. It was here that Barry made the acquaintance of Lord Charles' youngest brother, who was a couple of years older than Barry, Lord Fitzroy Somerset. And this was much to James Barry's advantage because Lord Fitzroy was the secretary to the head of the army. Um, this, the commander in chief was there and Lord Fitzroy was in the office right next to him for many years. And he, um, uh, he was able to get Barry out of trouble on, uh, and on occasions because um, a letter would be, if Barry had done something which uh, the governor thought was um, unhelpful, he would write to the, Lord, to the, to the, the, uh, the commander in chief. Fitzroy Somerset would get the uh, letter, first of all, read it, and then make a plan. So this was a very, um, uh, this man was a, a very important friend to Dr. Barry. You'll notice that he's lost his right arm. That was during Waterloo when he had it amputated uh, uh, just off, off the battlefield. Um, 
it rings a bell with me because my own father lost his right arm at about the same place during the First World War when he was doing, involved in putting um, dynamite under German trenches in France. <coughs> so uh, I, have, I've, I can understand what, um, what Lord Fitzroy Somerset was feeling. <coughs> now, it was at this stage that a very exciting development came my way. Um, something which was entirely new and previously completely unknown in this story about Dr. James Barry. In the archives at Badminton, Badminton is the home of the uh, Duke, Duke of, um, uh, not the Duke of Summers, the Duke of, uh, Duke of Beaufort, and I, I was given access to a set of letters written by Lord Charles Somerset to his elder brother, who was the sixth duke. And um, with the permission of his grace, I was um, able to uh, extract um, items of interest to Barry's story from the correspondence, which had never be before been examined and managed to survive the, uh, the assault that uh, old Queen Mary and the then Duchess of uh, both it made on, on the uh, archival material during the war. And Queen Mary was, uh, was, was, I was going to say stationed, she lived at, uh, at um, uh, Badminton and she and the Duchess, when deciding what to do, went and riffled through the papers there and uh, I was told by the archivist that uh, they'd lost a lot of um, in, useful information from the, from the, uh, the archives. So. <clears throat> there were six letters, and um, much. I think the Duke wanted. Uh, there was there was political stuff in them as well as horse stuff, and I think he did not want uh, the political material of the day to come out, and so he put a very strict um, rules of um, of use of these letters. And the first letter was dated October the eleventh, eighteen thirty nine. Um, this is Lord Charles's handwriting, and um, I can tell you it, was, it looks better here than it did in, in reality, but it is very difficult to, to decipher this. Um, for example, that up there um, at the beginning, um, I thought that said Bournemouth. Um, can anybody guess what it does say? Well, it actually says Newmarket which stands to reason because that was one of Lord Charles's favourite places but his, uh, the writing is very difficult to sort out so he was at Newmarket on that occasion and then um, he uh, sent several other letters from different places and I just want to um, uh, look at these these are where places where he went um, Newmarket is just on the border of Cambridgeshire about about there, and he went first of all to uh, um, uh, Snetcham Hall up there in um, in uh, uh, just on the on the uh, on the, the wash, which is a big embayment in in uh, into the uh, East Anglia, and then from there he went um, down to um, Newmarket again. And he, uh, Lord um, uh, um, Somerset's brother, um, suggested that, Lord, that uh, Lord Charles be seen by the president of the Royal College of Physicians. Um, that was um, a, uh, a, a man called, um, he'd been the president for 25 years and um, he was uh, uh, Sir, 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 William, Sir, Sir Henry Halford, sorry, there are a lot too many people. And Henry Halford um, uh, gave um, advice that he thought that Lord Charles should go to Bath, and take the water at Bath, that means drink it. And when Barry heard this, he was uh, very annoyed and thought that was a very bad idea. And surprisingly, it was a bad idea because the water at Bath has a very high content of salt. 
saline. And if you've got a person with cardiac failure, the last thing you want them to do is to load themselves with saline. But Barry didn't know that at the time. So, um, uh, 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 back in Newmarket, um, um, we got this message from Sir Henry Halford. And um, Halford was a well-known physician. He had been president of the Royal College of Physicians for no less than 24 years. Now, that must have caused a lot of, uh, a lot of um, fossilization. He enjoyed a particularly fashionable practice, and aristocratic women were said that they would prefer dying under Sir Henry Halford than, rather than surviving with some lesser physician. But he was described as vain, cringing to his superiors, and haughty to his inferiors. So he must have been quite an unpleasant sort of fellow. <clears throat> anyway, um, if we look at this map, in, in the, the January, uh, Lord Charles and his party found themselves at Bath, uh, which he loathed. Um, he lodged at number 24 Bennett Street, which a house which is still there. And a couple of days later, there was another long letter to, to his brother, the Duke. Lord Charles was not happy. He wrote, living in a lodging house, which of all things I detest, instead of one's own comfortable nest. He disliked being away from home was not benefiting from drinking the water, which tasted foul. The water contains, has anyone been to Bath? Yes. Yeah. Have you drunk the water? Yes. It's awful, it's got a lot of sulfur in it. Yes. So not only, the, not only the sodium chloride, but sulfur. So Lord Charles wasn't happy with that. And um, he, <clears throat> he just couldn't wait to get away from the place. He continued, Dr. Barry arrived here on Tuesday evening in a tolerably sane mind, quite so indeed, until I mentioned Sir Henry Holford, and then he went off in a, in a huff. I shouldn't mention, I shan't mention that again. <clears throat> On Tuesday night, I coughed in the most violent manner for six and a half hours um, <clears throat> without breaking. Last night, he, Barry, gave me something to check the, the quantity and the glutinousness of the phlegm which I was coughing up. It certainly had some effect and procured me some sleep. It is to me, who could never swallow an onion, a most nauseous thing I ever had, being the juice of onions in some syrup of roses. Now that sounds a bad taste combination. So bad I taste, smell and breathe onions. I took a few spoons full three times during the night. Continuing, he said, our keep, uh, our keep is as cheap as any here. This is in um, where the, the lodgings, but enormously dear. Nine guineas a week for his whole party, and about as uh, uh, commodious as any, which is very little. So Lord Charles was not a happy person at, uh, in Bath, and he couldn't wait to get out of the place. And a few days later, um, on January the 8th, he wrote another letter to Badminton. Things were not good. I am in a sad state, both in spirits and everything else. However, by January the 23rd, he had managed to escape from Bath and was at, castle, at the Castle Inn in Marlborough. That's, that is there. And there was a sort of um, gentleman's conservative party club there, and so he felt entirely happy in that uh, environment. <coughs> and um, uh, there was another letter from February the 4th from uh, uh, Thetford, which was up there, so he'd gone back up to... Uh, uh, back up to the East Anglia, and then he uh, he went down to London, and finally he rode to from London to Brighton. Um, he 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 reached Brighton on uh, the uh, the 14th of February. Um, and for three days before his death, Lord Charles rode out, rode out a little, on each occasion being accompanied by Dr. Barry. On the 18th of February, he died. He was 63 years old. 
Um, according to his wishes, he had a very simple funeral at St. Andrew's Church, Hove. Uh, we can see that this is the memorial which his wife had erected in, in the, the crypt of that church. And of all the uh, people at the uh, funeral, Dr. Barry was the only one who was not part of the family. Um, <coughs> So over a year earlier um, than this, Dr. Barry, while he was still in England, Dr. Barry had been appointed to a post in Jamaica. But owing to the illness of Lord Charles, this was de deferred and deferred and deferred. But now that Lord Charles was no longer alive, he was then able to proceed to Jamaica and take up his, um, his appointment there. Let's have the next slide, please. This is a... A, a, a rhyme by William Cowper, which you can uh, read. He was a well-known um, English poet of the late 18th century. Jamaica depended on um, sugar, largely for, um, for the, the ordinary uses of sugar, and the byproduct rum, which was very popular. And um, by this time, um, the, the 18, 1820, 1830, the, the, the great days of sugar, uh, sugar farming were over. The, the, the land was exhausted. It was becoming much more expensive for, for labor. Many of the owners did not actually live in Jamaica, but they had agents. And the, um, the sugar industry was no longer as profitable as it had been. <coughs> Dr. Barry, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, let's just uh, show you. Yes, it, Jamaica is there. And um, you, uh, are you familiar with the Caribbean? There's, there's Cuba, is that one. This is Haiti over here, the Hispaniola. And, and um, that is um, not Cuba, it's the other place there. And Jamaica is here. These are the uh, wind, Leeward Islands, and the Windward Islands are south here, the, and we'll come to those later. But this is where he was going. The next slide, please. And this is a map of Jamaica, and Kingston, Jamaica, is, is over here, and this is a big harbor at, at Kingston, uh, and Port Royal, which was a great pirate uh, outpost in, in days gone by. <coughs> So, Dr. Barry, next slide, please. Dr. Barry arrived in Port Royal on um, Sunday, the 12th of June, 1831, and this is a notice in the local newspaper. Um, in the Guardian, Dr. Barry of the, uh, of the military, and the Reverend Ch John Crow. So, we have proof of his arrival, which appeared in the press, and... Um, <coughs> He first of all introduced himself to the um, at headquarters uh, to Sir Willoughby Cotton, who was, who was the um, officer in command, and he uh, was not an uninteresting character himself. Sir Willoughby was always destined to be a soldier. He went to rugby school um, in uh, which is in Warwickshire in rugby. Um, as from about the age of 12 in 1795. And um, two years later, he showed his qualities of leadership when he started the Great Rebellion at the school. The pupils thought that the headmaster was being a bit, had a bit of a bad attitude when a window had been broken and accordingly um, locked the door of their classroom. Under uh, Willoughby Cotton's guidance, the pupils used dynamite, sorry, used gunpowder to blast the door open. They burnt all the desks. It sounds as though this was almost what was happening up the road here the other day. <laughs> Something familiar. But this was, this was in uh, 1795. Things don't change. So he did all that, and um, the local, local militia had to be called in, the civil defense people could, and Cotton was amongst those expelled. He was about uh, 13 or 14 then. And having thus shown his qualities of leadership, it comes as no surprise to, uh, that his, with this military potential, he joined the army in the following year at the age of 15. 
And um, <coughs> so that is Sir Willoughby Cotton, and he had a, a long and uh, distinguished career in the army, and f mercifully mi missed the, uh, uh, the disaster in Kabul um, years later. Um, by the time, that, after he'd got there, but there was this sort of um, standard practice for a doc doctor or any medical officer joining. He would go and make himself known to the officer commanding, which is Cotton, to the uh, principal medical officer, and which is Dr. Draper in this case, and then he would uh, get his instructions and do his ward round. So Dr. Barry then eventually did his, did his duty. And um, his views on cleanliness, not only in the hospital, but particularly in the crowded barracks. Personal cleanliness, he insisted the men wash and clean themselves. And punctuality and correct turnout of all his staff at all times. There was no compromise there. Uh, what he was doing was a setting down a discipline. And with that discipline, he hoped that the clinical work would be done with an equal discipline. Um, he, uh, um, let's just go back one, one slide, another one. Yes, <clears throat> the, uh, the, ca the, ca uh, the camp was uh, the army camp up park, which is the main, was the main camp, and which is still the headquarters of the Jamaican army, was situated, um, this is the, the harbour over here, was situated just up here, but Barry chose not to stay there at those barracks. And he went to a place called Stony Hill, which was quite a way up, a few miles up there. And he traveled, next slide please, next one, next one. He traveled, he was, the army gave him a broom, and, uh, which is like a sort of an MG of the time. And he would travel each day down from, uh, from Stony Hill to Up Park in this, uh, this carriage. Um, Barry had a certain amount of style, as one can say. Um, <clears throat> now, while he was here in Jamaica, Dr. Barry acquired, as I put here, more than a servant, so much as a lifelong companion. It was here that he took on a young soldier, a former slave, as his soldier servant later buying him out of the army. If he wanted to keep, this happened uh, not infrequently, um, but you couldn't just take the man who was a soldier out, you actually had to pay and get him out that way. And um, neither the doctor nor this man could have imagined that their particular relationship was to endure uninterrupted until Barry's death over 30 years later. And that was, shows that um, there was in, uh, absolute loyalty between both the servant and his master. <clears throat> Several descriptions of Dr. Barry from this period have come down to us. And these are, give us insights into the character of Dr. Barry, which we would not otherwise uh, obtain. These must, many of these appeared in The Lancet in uh, 1895. Um, and these men were now old, and, but these were still clear recollections they have. General Chamberlain, for example, wrote with sympathy and insight, I knew him or her in Jamaica. One peculiarity was a strictly vegetable diet, no meat or even wine or other liquor. A queer fondness for animals, rather bombastic in speech and repellent in manner, but kind and anxious to do good to those who were never likely to become in intrusive or familiar or troublesome to her. So she was standoffish with the officers, but very open with the men. Chamberlain continued with insight and sympathy. When I think of the anxiety, care and trouble she must have experienced for years to keep up the assumed character. It seems surprising how she could have possessed so many good points. For I saw a great deal of her in Jamaica. I believe her manner and speech were assumed to repel inquisitive uh, associates. It must have been a life of great misery to have been obliged to be continually acting a part 
to, so repellent to her better feelings. Effectively, Margaret Bulkley was to live a lie for no less than 56 years. And if you think, if, if, when we tell a porky, which we all do, <coughs> the thing is, you, if you've told, told a lie, you have to remember that you've told a lie. Because if you don't remember it, then you get into trouble because the person you're talking to will pick, pick up the, the, the falsehood. And to actually uh, live an existence of a, an, an untruth for that length of time must have been exceptionally stressful. <clears throat> the presence of the army in Jamaica in large numbers, two, two and a half thousand men, had everything to do with three things, the three S's, sugar, slavery, and s security. It was simply a policing force and not at all concerned with protection of the colony against any foreign enemy, because at that time there were no foreign enemies to Britain, no foreign threat to Britain. <clears throat> now, with these this two and a half thousand men, the mortality rate of the troops was horrendous. In Jamaica alone, between 1817 and 1836, when a 20-year survey was carried out, um, the mortality rate um, averaged 313 men who died every year. Now, if you think there's 365 days in the year, that is most days there was some, someone died. Um, um, no less than 12% of the command died every year. <clears throat> For practical purposes, these deaths were due to disease of one kind or another, particularly malaria, and yellow fever. But in Jamaica, there were two additional factors as the exceptionally high incidence of alcohol-related um, disorders, including cirrhosis, uh, delirium tremens, as well as, and the other one, with the alcohol, the d discipline broke down, and so the men were doing things they shouldn't have done, and so they would be punished, which meant lashes. And there was the, a death um, a, a death associated with excessive punishment as well. So Dr. Barry had not encountered anything quite like this before. Um, the figures for black troops were far, far better because black troops were much more steady than their white colleagues. They appeared to enjoy a herd immunity against malaria. That is because there was certain uh, what is called sickle cell disease or a sickle trait in, in uh, West Africa, which actually protects a person from, against malaria. Um, they didn't abuse alcohol to the extent that British soldiers did. So they didn't have the, um, uh, and they led a healthier and more uh, responsible lifestyle. But they were much more susceptible to smallpox, in which case, in, on which account Dr. Barry introduced inoculation, and tuberculosis, about which at that stage nothing could be done. So, with the causes of these fevers, yellow fever and, and malaria, a complete mystery, there was a plethora of ineffectual treatments, and I'm not going to mention these, but I, what I am going to say is, interestingly, Dr. Draper's report re recorded only a single case where quinine was used in treating a man with fever. Now, back in uh, this, the Spanish missionaries had discovered the use of quinine in the mid-1600s, and here we are in getting towards the mid-1800s when the British Army hadn't even taken this particular method of treatment on board. <coughs> Six months after his arrival in Jamaica, and the only time in his entire career Dr. Barry saw active service. The event was next. Have the next slide, please. The next. Uh, the event was um, called Sam Sharp's Rebellion. Samuel Sharp was a, um, a slave who was an exceptional person, and he uh, was also a Baptist minister. He was uh, ordained. And he, uh, years later, B Barry wrote, I served under Sir Willoughby Cotton during the rebellion and the burning of the plantations by the Negroes. I was in medical charge of the troops employed on that service. So what was the Sam Sharp's rebellion? It started simply as a strike. 
and it happened because Christmas Day was on a Sunday on this year. And the Monday was Boxing Day, and the slaves had the reasonable expectation that the following day, because Christmas Day was on a day off anyway, that they would be given the Tuesday. So that they had that expectation. But the, um, the owners, the plantation owners and the, um, uh, the agents were very mean-spirited, and they denied this uh, request. And Sam Sharp then said, well, we will have a strike on that day. But matters got out of hand because um, uh, some slaves had broken into a, um, a rum store and they got uh, very drunk. And before long, the whole matter got out of hand. And plantations were burned. There were attacks. There were, uh, people were killed. And um, eventually, um, after a week, uh, the, the army left um, uh, Jamaica, the Kingston Harbour. The, the vessel went around uh, to Montego Bay. Let's uh, can we have a look? <coughs> back one. Sorry. Back. Yes, Montego Bay is. Um, sorry, here we are. Is over here, and it's now a very popular tourist resort. But there, it, at that time, it had a very sinister reputation for uh, for malaria. And um, Dr. Barry then, for the first time, found himself dealing with real injuries, real wounds, and the, the, there were gunshot wounds, bullets to be removed, and they also the the machetes which the um, uh, slaves used for cutting the cane were used as swords, and there were the, uh, quite ferocious accidents um, on that account. So <clears throat> that was the Sam Sharp's Rebellion and Dr. Barry's only period of active service in his entire career. Um, next slide, please. So, 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 social life in Jamaica um, continued after the rebellion, and um, <coughs> The Lewis Walpole Library has got a number of images, but this is a, a grand ball in, in Jamaica, and you can, uh, you can spend ages looking at this. You get the, the, musicians are up, or, uh, the musicians are up there. These are the onlookers, and uh, it's all the sort of stuff that you fi find at a, 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 a ball. So we, can, we can't go. Um, now, meanwhile, time passed and important political events were taking place elsewhere in the British Empire. Um, uh, St. Helena had been in the hands of the English East India Company for um, about a, a century and a half. <coughs> During um, Napoleon's uh, incarceration there, uh, the, the, it, it had come under British rule, and it was handed back briefly to the um, uh, East India Company, but by this time, things had changed in India as well, and the, the East India Company was then no longer trading so much as being an army of occupation. And so Britain decided to put a permanent um, presence into St. Helena, and... Um, the army was definitely going to be needed to defend this uh, new crown colony. And that meant that there would have to be a military hospital and medical staff would be uh, required. So James McGregor, the head of the army medical department, his eye had fallen on Dr. Barry, whose record had been in Jamaica had been a good one. <clears throat> this was an appointment as principal medical officer. Previous authors have... Um, uh, taken this to mean a promotion within the army, but it was not a promotion within the army. Dr. Barry's uh, military rank remained the same. same. It was a, 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 an office which he held, not a promotion, not a rank. So, <coughs> let's have the next slide, please. The, the, the episode at St. Helena was not a, it didn't start happily and it didn't end happily. Um, he was on St. Helena for 16 months, and um, right from the, from the get-go, it was things did not go well, because after they, he sailed from, uh, from London aboard a ship called uh, Lord William Bentinck, who, who was an East Indian uh, 
uh, functionary of, uh, director of the company. And um, they set sail um, uh, on the 4th of September. This was about the time, this was in 18, uh, 1836, when if, if we look at this, uh, what we were doing here, this is when the Fort Trekkers were sort of starting to leave the Cape Colony and go, and go to the interior. That's just to sort of fix the time in, in our own minds. So um, they had only been at, at sea um, for a couple of weeks when there was an outbreak of smallpox on, on the vessel brought aboard by a doctor and uh, there was one death and, but no other serious cases. So with smallpox aboard they definitely couldn't put in at St Helena and they had to go to the, the nearest um, quarantine station which happened to be in Cape Town. Um, at the Siobhan Battery. Let's have this next. This is the. Have, has anybody here visited the Siobhan Battery at the docks? Yes, it's very interesting. Very interesting. And this is what the place looked like before it got built up with hotels and other things. But there's the wall of the battery. And when you go into it, you can actually go along the wall there and see the gun emplacements. So <coughs> Barry was quarantined there. P everybody who got off the ship including animals, including Barry's dog, which had to swim ashore. Um, she had a small white pooch. Um, and they were put in quarantine, um, uh, and everything that could be sterilized um, was, was sterilized. And during that, that process, Barry lost um, the sterilizing, the, the lime was very strong, and clothes and other things were just simply fell to pieces after being in the, in uh, the lime water for a long time. And um, this actually caused Barry quite a significant amount to financial loss. And he wrote to the governor an indignant letter to the governor about this. And he put in a claim, and uh, Sir Benjamin Durbin was the governor at the time, summarily dismissed the claim, which uh, was rather tough because he, to get to, uh, back to, um, St. Helena. He actually had to pay his own fare to get there, so he didn't do too well out of that. <clears throat> and he calculated his loss to be 142 pounds. And uh, if you turn that into money today, multiply that by 100, about 1,000, uh, about 14,300 uh, pounds in today's lot, which is a lot of money. Um, he also lamented the loss of three pillows of a particular description. Uh, which were necessary to me under the peculiar circumstances into which severe accidents have placed me and which cost me approximately 15 guineas each. Now, um, I can only think that those pillows were probably um, made by a corsetier to, to fill in Barry's um, chest and make him, give him a more masculine type of contour. Um, they were obviously expensive for the time, and um, I, th I think that's what they were, but th that is never actually revealed. Anyway, um, he, uh, while in Cape Town, he managed to renew his acquaintance with his godson, um, James Barry Munich, with whom he continued to correspond even after getting to St. Helena with this 11-year-old. Um, but in one of this boy's letters, he said, the boy said, people are talking about you and saying that you look rather like a lady. Uh, this is out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, as it were. And that, as far as Barry was concerned, the shutters came down immediately and there was no further contact with the boy. <coughs> So what, what the, the PMO eventually got to St. Helena, um, months late, and um, his first inspection did not best please him. The many problems he encountered were significant and required addressing with a degree of urgency. It was unfortunate, therefore, that an individual as energetic and active and innovative as Dr. Barry found himself mismatched with a governor as stolid, unsure of himself as a general Middlemore. In fact, I said I thought the name Muddlemore might be more appropriate for him. 
because he was very um, slow off the mark. He was very um, uh, hidebound by regulations, which he didn't know well. And in one of the letters I read uh, um, from Lord Glenelg, who was uh, no, no saint himself, to General Middlemore, telling him point by point how to make his, um, his um, reports to uh, the, 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 foreign, the uh, colonial secretary because Middlemore's reports were in a complete mess. It must have been quite embarrassing. So, <clears throat> um, now, uh, the, the, Barry, the regimental hospital, let's have the next slide, please. Sorry, this is what St. Helena looks like from the... Um, from the sea, uh, not a, I haven't been to St. Helena. Anyone here been to St. Helena? Some people. Too. Does it look like something like that from the sea? No, you are. And I think this this um, uh, image is somewhat misleading because this is Jamestown, and we're looking south. But Jamestown's on the southwestern uh, uh, part of the island. And what happened is when an engraver engraves a painting, he engraves it as he sees it. And then when it's printed, it comes out the wrong way around. <clears throat> I have a, 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 an engraving in my study of um, Hottentots in, you know, doing an induction ceremony for the young. And it has, has Devil's Peak and Table Mountain in the background, but they're the wrong way around too. <clears throat> right, so what um, Barry saw, he saw the regimental hospital, which this is, of which this is an example. And uh, that dated from the time of the East India Company. It was, uh, Barry described it as clean and well arranged. But the civilian hospital was something else. <coughs> a horse of a different colour. As he walked between rows of untidy beds, the PMO was deeply disturbed to see a large number of women with venereal diseases which the attendant informed him was owing to the numbers of females left destitute on the removal of the East India Company's soldiers. <coughs> and these women were now obliged to resort to prostitution for their support. A number of men of the company's militia who had now departed were formerly either married to or had enjoyed stable relationships with the local women to their mutual benefit. <coughs> Pleading for a solution to the problem, it was found that a nearby disused bakery building could be converted for hospital use, and the PMO requested that this be done. No less than nine months after the, this request, nine months, and remember this is a tiny island, St. Helena is about a third of the size of the Cape Peninsula. Um, General Middlemore at long last wrote a report to Whitehall notifying Lord Glenelg that um, he'd got an estimate for the work. Not to say the work was started or even finished, but it, he got an estimate. <clears throat> there were additional equipment and expendables needed by any hospital. And again, there were these, this, this reluctance to actually um, supply these things from the, uh, uh, from the office. And um, in addition, Barry appointed a matron to be in charge of the nursing side of the hospital. Now, that was a complete innovation at the time. We're looking at uh, in the early 1830s. The, f the first matron in Britain, in London, was appointed at the, the Great Ormond Street Hospital in 1851. Her name was Mrs. Willie. And in 1854, Miss Ward Roper was at St. Thomas's Hospital was appointed. And it's just coincidental that I happened to work at both of those hospitals during my time in London. Um, the, um, uh, yes, the uh, equipment, uh, equipping the hospital with the beds, um, blankets, sheets, soap, the usual sort of stuff, um, took an inordinate amount of time. Um, and uh, Dr. Barry took the, um, the, in absolute frustration, he took the, the unusual step of writing directly to uh, Lord Glenelg about this. He, want, he had the hospital, he needed stuff to, 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 to work with, and it just wasn't coming from the commissariat. 
<laughs> so it, it was very um, un unorthodox and incorrect to write to the, uh, to, the, to the minister in charge, the Secretary of State for War and the Colonies. Um, of course the letter was, uh, uh, the copy of the letter was leaked in the small island, everybody gets to know everything, and um, uh, the, uh, um, the Knowles, the uh, assistant, the commissary, comm commissary general who was in charge of that, uh, he objected strongly to this, to the governor, uh, and a court martial was convened to, um, to try Dr. Barry for conduct misbecoming, unbecoming. <coughs> so Barry conducted his own defence <coughs> at this court martial, and it uh, took two weeks of arguments back and forth. And at the end, um, he was found. The found in Barry's. The finding was in Barry's favour. Uh, this was most unwelcome to General Middlemore and Commissary Knowles, who'd wanted, who'd really wished for, uh, expected that Barry would be found guilty. Uh, Middlemore wrote in uh, uh, annoyance to Lord Fitzroy Somerset, who was the secretary to the military commander, not being aware that he was a personal friend of Dr. Barry's. And um, uh, the, the, up, the uh, outcome of the, uh, of the of court martial was upheld. So there was a cross uh, governor and a cross uh, comm commissary general. Um, Despite this protracted and un, unpleasant litigation, Barry's work continued unabased, unabated. Um, under his supervision, the army doctors on the island saw an extraordinary mixed bag of patients, paupers, indigent persons, prisoners and convicts, lascars and invalids from the East India Company, seamen from the merchants, uh, uh, merchant services of English, Dutch, French and American ships. So there was a huge volume and there were always a lot of ships in the harbour, all of which had to be seen and uh, certified healthy or not. Um, <coughs> with all these um, people coming uh, into St Helena and St Helena waters, particularly from the Far East, where there was always uh, smallpox, it was essential that the uh, inhabitants of the island be immunised, and this is, uh, was um, uh, uh, the principal medical officer established an effective immunisation service. <coughs> now, what I'm going to read to you now is all new, and hasn't another thing which hasn't been known before. Um, there's a, 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 a woman on uh, St Helena who is an amateur. Um, um, archivist, and she has trawled through papers in the in the archives there, and um, uh, she has found all sorts of interesting factors. And in fact, published a little book which I used in my as my one of my sources. But <coughs> Barry was sent off from Celine, Saint Helena under arrest and uh, in disgrace. And it was not known, um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting on a bit. The, the reason for this is not known. And um, uh, it was found out that um, uh, uh, there was a certain uh, a Scottish regiment there. Um, and Colonel Anderson was um, the colonel in charge of that resident. And um, he wanted, uh, one of his soldiers um, went to have a, um, a medical done because he was, the soldier said he had been, the, the story was that he'd been desperately ill on the previous day. Now, this, um, this, the medical officer who examined him was known by Barry and he was respected. He issued a rather ambiguous report saying that no officer in the regiment is ill at the moment, which uh, really is is um, code for he, this chap is malingering. Anyway, the, the colonel wasn't satisfied and he demanded that the PMO see this, this man, Captain Thornhill himself. And back, Barry was on his way to see the man when he bumped into the medical officer who had already seen him, told him the story, and Barry then rode off and refusing to see the man. Um, 
The colonel was furious because colonels don't like being disobeyed. And um, he demanded that, the, that, uh, colonel, that uh, General Middlemore uh, institute a court martial for this uh, misdemeanor, which happened. And it took them seven months to decide um, that Barry was guilty of this uh, misdemeanor. Um, so I beg your pardon, five months <coughs> before they came to conclusion. And uh, Middlemore uh, was very happy to re report Dr. Barry, is, Dr. Barry is to be placed under arrest, ordered to return to England, and upon arrival to report himself to the Adjutant General of the Forces, who was Lord Fitzroy Somerset again, um, <coughs> for disciplining. So what do we make of this? Well, it was two things. It was simply about two men. It was the one did not wish to lose face, the colonel, and the other one was defending his turf, Dr. Barry. <coughs> General Middlemore sent the entire records of the proceedings to Lord Fitzroy, and the matter was then dropped. <coughs> Barry em embarked with... <laughs> Next slide, last slide. This is the new um, uh, Indiaman London, HERC London. Barry was embarked on that ship and sent back to England when nothing more was heard of the case. Um, incidentally, you can see how things are changing in this, uh, the times are changing. Here's the, the Indiaman being taken out by steam tug. Right, so that is um, all I have to say about um, uh, Dr. Barry uh, at Mauritius, Islands in the Sun, Mauritius. Um, in the trip back to England and then into um, uh, Jamaica and St. Helena. Thank you very much.